So I must say that, that you all are looking pretty good today. Looking pretty good today. Not that you don't always look pretty good, but, but I see some bodacious blazers out here. Yeah, you know? Not to play favorites, but you know, you know if I'm talking about you. And I see some, uh, I see some coats that I would covet up at the balcony there too, if coveting weren't a sin. And I see some pretty jazzy jackets. And those of you who, uh, who aren't wearing a coat, a blazer, or a jacket, think about the favorite one that you've got at home. And uh, let me ask you this. Before whom, when they rode into town, would you uh, lay out your coat, your blazer, your jacket? First century version of this is your cloak. Before whom, when they would ride into town, would you go and lay your cloak before them to ride over? The cloak, in first century terms, meant that you're laying out all your past, and you're laying out all your present, and you're laying out all your future, and you're laying out all you are, and you're laying out all you have before this one, and you're saying, you're the one. You're the one I serve. You're the king. You and no other. So I ask you, before whom would you lay out your cloak as they come into town? I read now from Luke 19, starting with verse 29, his version of Palm Sunday. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why? Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Some some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Hence the title of my message this morning, Silent Disciples Shouting Stones. So I ask you again, before whom would you throw down your cloak as they come into town? Now I haven't been able to fit into this sweater I could try, but it wouldn't work. I haven't been able to fit into this sweater since I was five years old, since I was in kindergarten. Just start in kindergarten. So walk with me. And we're standing, I'm standing, on Bridge Street in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. And I'm very excited because he's coming. He's supposed to be coming by any day now, any moment now, any second now. He's coming. I heard him on TV and he was talking about the Democratic Party. And I didn't know there were different kinds of parties. But you know, I love a parade. I love a parade. And this reminds me of Palm Sunday last year when Miss Heffelbauer had us all practice waving our palms and then practice putting our sweaters and our jackets on the aisle for Jesus to walk through on Palm Sunday. I'm so excited and and now, now I hear the crowd begin to yell and there he is, there he is in the second car. He's coming by. I thought he had brown hair on TV, but it's, it's blonde now. They say he's been sailing a lot. He's sitting there and the car has no top and he's waving and his scream and yell of excitement goes up to the sky. And I wriggle and I try to pull away from my mom, but she grabs onto me. She says, don't run out there, it's dangerous. And I know that. And besides, this is not, this is not the Prince of Peace coming by. This is 
well, this is just a man who wants my mommy and daddy to make him the president. So now we fast forward 30 years. I hate being cold, so cold. I've got my two-year-old Matthew on one hip. He's getting heavier by the moment. I've got my daughter Rebecca, and I've got her by the shoulder, because I don't want her to run out in the street. And, and here he comes down the main street of Yardley, Pennsylvania. Here he comes, and the shouts go up to the sky, the screams of adoration. The candy canes rain down from heaven, and there he is on his red fire engine. I grab them both a little tighter. I think they know better than to run out there and lay their coats in front of his wheels, but, well, for one thing, it's too cold. And for another, huh, this, is not, <laughs> this is not the king of kings and the prince of peace. This is the king of retail. Now, we're all standing. We're lying in the road between Jerusalem and Bethany, and right about now, he's rounding the bend at the Mount of Olives, and he's coming, he's coming, and we're excited, and we're watching for him. And we, we look in the distance, and there he is! Is he riding a four-horse chariot like we hope? Like a Roman Empire emperor would? No. No, no motorcade, no, not even a fire engine. He's on a donkey? Well, that's a disappointment. I mean, I know Zechariah said that, lo, your king will come, victorious. I like that part. But humble, riding on a donkey, not so much. But there he comes, and, and we, we run out, we put our cloaks before him, we, we wave the palm branches, we know, we know, that if he would get with our program, he could whoop the Romans. I mean, this is the man who, who raised Lazarus from the dead and made a blind man see and multiplied loaves for food. He could do anything he wanted to. So let's encourage him to be the kind of king we want. Let's shout, Hosanna, God saves from the Romans. God saves, Hosanna. Let's shout, encourage him as he comes by, the king the king of kings. We make quite a ruckus. We're so boisterous that the Pharisees, who in the Gospel of Luke, you know, sometimes uh, do a good turn to Jesus. They invite him to dinner lots of times, potluck dinners. And they uh, sometimes warn him that Herod's out to get him. And here they say, they say to us, or to Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. Tell your disciples to stop shouting. They don't want a messianic demonstration with fire hoses and attack dogs and the Toronto Centurion sandals and tear gas. Shh, tell your disciples to stop. And he says what? He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. He's right. The disciples in the painful days to come all fall silent and it's up to a, a handful of non-disciples to stand by Jesus, to stand by Jesus. Let me introduce you to a couple of them. One of them is the servant girl of the high priest. We need a little timeline here. Today's Sunday, Thursday night, Lord's Supper, Jesus goes to Gethsemane, he prays while his disciples sleep. Judas comes with troops, they, they grab Jesus, they bind him, and they take him to the high priest's house. There they mock and spit and strike, humiliate and strip him. And as that's going on, as he's going by, there in the courtyard of the high priest, there's a servant girl, and she's tending a fire. And I know this is a tiki, tiki lamp, but you're gonna have to work with me, all right? Think first century. So here she is. She's tending a fire in the courtyard. Let's, uh, let's hear what she might say. There he comes. There he comes. 
why are they pushing him like that? Why are they shoving him like that? There are no hosannas now. There's no cloaks in front of him now. And here he comes. I hate to see a man like that treated like that. I've heard of him, Jesus of Nazareth. I've heard of him. And yesterday I almost met him. I was outside the temple and I heard him teaching a group of men. And he he pointed to this old woman, this old poor woman. And he said, she has done all more than all of you, putting in her two cents. I've never heard a male rabbi, a rabbi, praise a woman and a poor one. And then as if he saw me looking at him, he turned and he met my eyes. And and he smiled at me. He smiled at me. As if if to say, you, you are not just poor and you're not just somebody's servant who doesn't really deserve the air you breathe like your, your boss would say, but you are a person of value. I even heard that he eats with people like me. He eats with prostitutes and tax collectors and servants and shepherds and tanners. A man like that shouldn't be treated like that. And then who's that guy? Who's that guy following at a distance? (laughs) Capital D. (laughs) There, who's he? I recognize him. And now, now he's coming over here to my fire and he's pulling his cloak around himself and he's warming himself at my fire (sighs) while not 100 feet away his friend is being treated to God knows what. What kind of friend is this who warms himself at a fire while his friend, his master, is being abused? I I have a speak when spoken to rule, but I broke it. And I spoke, I spoke loudly, and I looked at him over the firelight, and I said, you were one of his friends. You were with him. You are a disciple. Mm. Off into the darkness. I may be just a servant girl, but I know the difference between a friend and a coward. Now the next shouting stone shows up in Matthew 27. She has a bit part and she is Pilate's wife. And again with the timeline, Jesus is beaten and mocked that night, Thursday night, spends the night in prison. Friday morning he is taken bound before Pilate. Pilate sits in the judgment seat and passes judgment on Jesus. And the night before, something happens in the life of Pilate's wife. And here we go. Last night I I saw them bringing bringing him to the high priest's palace. I saw them pushing him, shoving him. I saw them, I saw the way they treated him. And looking down from my window, I had this absurd urge to to take off my cloak and to throw it down there so he could have something to put around his shoulders. He he looked cold. He looked up as he as he passed and and met my eyes and, and nodded. And and I couldn't I couldn't go to sleep. I don't know him. What's this to me? But I couldn't sleep. Finally, I fell into this troubled rest, and and in the middle of the night, I had this dream, and I sat in my husband's judgment seat, and I looked out at this young prisoner. He had the kindest eyes that glowed back at me. And I heard a voice, and the voice began softly and got louder, and it said, he is innocent. He is innocent, he is innocent. Release him, release him, release him. I woke up in a cold sweat, realizing that that voice was mine. So early this morning, I wrote a note to my husband. He's now in the judgment seat deciding this young man's fate. I wrote him a note and I said, have nothing to do with this innocent man 
for I have been deeply troubled by a dream about him in the night. I sent it off. He's probably reading it now. I doubt it'll do much good, but at least for once I did, I did something. The final shouting stones, and really they only shouted in their hearts, not with their lips, but they are the women at the cross the women from Galilee who stood and waited and stood watch as Jesus hung on the cross, thinking, saying perhaps something like this. We know that we can't do anything to prevent this. It's too late, but we can stand. We can stand witness to our love for him that is a faithfulness stronger even than death. We can stand, witness. We can at least let him know as his his eyes look toward us that in his suffering, he is not completely alone. And we can prepare our cloaks so that when he is taken down from the cross, we'll make them ready to wrap his body for the grave. There's a title that a lot of preachers like to give to their Good Friday sermons, and it's this. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Today, it's more like, it's Sunday, but Friday's coming. And so, we have a choice to make. We can scatter like cockroaches, afraid of a heavy boot, scatter off, preoccupied with our own concerns, forgetting about him until we pop back in for the chocolate and the trumpets. Or we can stand by him in all the painful days that lie ahead. We can decide that we're going to go all in for Jesus now, today. We can decide that we're gonna give him all our past. We're gonna lay out all our present. We're gonna lay out all our future. We're gonna lay out all we have. We're gonna lay out all we are in his path. We're gonna keep the hosannas rising to the skies. We're gonna roll out the red carpet. We're gonna take a page out of the the Shouting Stones playbook. We're gonna we're going to show what it is to have character in a time of testing and stand by a friend. We're going, to, we're going to speak up like Pilate's wife for somebody who can't speak for themselves. We're going to stay, to stand with someone who is suffering and let them know, let them know they're not alone this week. So right about now, he is... I think he's rounding the bend at Spring Creek in Coit. He'll be coming down the aisle soon. And uh, you know what that means. You know what time it is. It's time to praise his name and lay our cloaks in his path. Roll out the red carpet for the King of Kings.